This is a Scrap Studio production and you're listening to The Inflammatory Wanderer, a Scrap's original podcast that seeks to unpick, untangle and chronicle the perceived eureka moment in the acquaintances that the human race has made with the 10th cranial nerve, the vagus, for the treatment of many disorder, specifically some of the immune-mediated inflammatory disorders. In the last two episodes, we chronicled how the move from understanding the role that vagus nerve played in sensing inflammatory mediators, a crucial role played by Linda Watkins and her group, to the group in New York's Feinstein Institute testing it in acute models of inflammation and sepsis, to then how this was hypothesized to potentially aid chronic inflammatory disorders like rheumatoid arthritis and inflammatory bowel disease. All along, we looked at the evidence and sequence of events that should make us realize that that science is a team sport. And despite the mass media's oversimplification, we as scientists and citizens of the world should hold ourselves to a higher moral code and ensure that we constantly and ubiquitously credit the manner in which the innovation is made, bettered and sustained. And at no point, as we point out, that kudos or accolades must be sought. In fact, much like what we talk about respect, kudos and accolades must follow and be mentioned by others and should not be self-proclaimed or planted. Well, there is one point that we must heavily contend with though. While it might feel like we are singling out one person through all of this, we can honestly say that hands on our hearts that we have no agenda except to highlight the evidence and let you the listener decide on what conclusion you must draw. I always call myself as PM, Postman. My job is to take the evidence and deliver it in a cogent form to your ears and just like how you open your mail and read it, you make the decision. I'm Arun Sridhar and you're listening to The Inflammatory Wanderer. Now, so far, we took a parasympathetic view to how the inflammation modulation was viewed with a single parasympathetic angle. In fact, the pathway was labeled as cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway before it was changed to an inflammatory reflex. But if you take the non-sympathetic view, or in this case, the parasympathetic view, there must be a sympathetic view as well, isn't it? That's what we know about the nervous system. In fact, The autonomic nervous system has a sympathetic side and a whole host of nerves associated with it. And then the question that pops in our head is, are we really right in calling this anti-inflammatory reflex as parasympathetic or simplifying it by calling it cholinergic? Is it really true that both sensory and efferent arms of the reflex as it is postulated is truly cholinergic and parasympathetic? Well, that's what we are here to solve. To aid understanding, we're going to restate the proposed cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway for you. The liver senses cytokines, conveys their presence to the brain via the vagal nerve endings to the brainstem. This impulse then travels up to the afferent or sensory nuclei in the brainstem and then somehow the inflammation interplay happens in the brainstem and that leads to the dorsal motor vagal nuclei, the place where vagal efferents originate, to bounce it back via the vagus to impact the signaling down to the abdomen or to the junction box, the celiac plexus, as it is said. The celiac plexus is pretty much like the telephone box that's up your street. It receives innervation that are both vagus and the spinal sympathetic nerves, like the greatest plantric nerve. This celiac plexus then bounces this information to the spleen via the nerves that form a mesh around the splenic artery. In scientific speak, you call this mesh of nerves around the artery as a plexus. Then you have the cascade that then impacts immune cells in the spleen that acts to dampen cytokine release from the macrophages. Just in the last week, there is a new manuscript that challenges the view that has already been proposed whereby lymphocytes as proposed by the Feinstein Institute investigator is not essentially required for the transduction of the inflammatory reflex. The link to that paper is in the show notes. Now, before we go any further, we must state that the nerve plexus around the artery like the spleen are not unique. 
most visceral blood vessels especially arteries in the abdomen are tightly controlled by innervation to both vascular smooth muscle and endothelium via nerve plexus that ultimately release a cocktail of neurotransmitters the most widely known of which are epinephrine and norepinephrine or what some people will call as adrenaline and noradrenaline this type of neural plexus is present around the splenic artery the renal artery the pancreatic artery and even the hepatic artery as an example the release of neurotransmitters tightly control both the function of the blood vessels themselves and of where these blood vessels ultimately lead to they control vasomotor tone or the blood vessel tone we will need a separate podcast series to be honest to discuss how this happens and all the history behind this which in itself is absolutely fascinating but if you know of a good sponsor who will pay for this do let us know until then let's come back to the job at hand so the simplest view that one can take and probably one that people should have asked is how the freak is the pathway called cholinergic if there is a norepinephrine release by a purely sympathetic nerve like the splenic nerve in the middle you get what i'm saying while it is the most simplest question that one can ask there are more complex questions so we will let you mull that over for a few seconds in your head second what if i told you that the view that it's all vagus and no other efferent component was involved is on very shaky grounds and once again i must state that this is fundamentally unimportant for clinical benefit as i would argue that one doesn't need to know every intricate detail of the pathway for clinical translation but honestly there are bucket loads of evidence to suggest that the efferent arm could also be sympathetic and i must state that the jury is still out there and by no means is entirely proven to be one way or the other but let me share the evidence evidence number 1 ever wonder how the standard treatments for inflammation work well let me give you an example the humble glucocorticoid injection the glucocorticoid is a native steroid as you might know and is a portmanteau complex of a glucose and a steroid derived from the adrenal cortex it plays a critical role in glucose metabolism and inflammation control and when administered via an injection it binds to the glucocorticoid receptors and regulates the transcriptional production of inflammatory mediators like cytokines so in fact the discovery of glucocorticoid was done by thomas addison who used adrenal extracts from calves to treat his patients who suffered from muscle fatigue muscular degeneration weight loss and a strange darkening of the skin a very well known personality who was affected by addison's disease was john f kennedy but thomas addison's work happened in the 19th century in 1946 almost close to 70 years later four compounds were isolated from the adrenal extract by edward kendall and then as it is relevant to this episode synthesized and used in a patient with rheumatoid arthritis by a rheumatologist philip hench this won the nobel prize for both kendall who isolated it from the adrenal extract and hench who treated it in a clinical patient in 1950 So our body natively produces glucocorticoids in response to normal circadian rhythms with humans showing high levels in the morning and then waning through the day. And undoubtedly stress elevates the glucocorticoids which exerts other metabolic effects and causes harm. So you can't have too much of glucocorticoids in your body as well. But why are we saying all this? because the role of endogenous glucocorticoids can be regulated by other nerve targets and by modalities that impact sympathetic tone for example many studies much like how vagus nerve stimulation 
in mice models of lipopolysaccharide-induced sepsis have been tested with other nerve targets as well. The most notable of this is a stimulation of the nerve that innervates the carotid sinus. The nerve stimulation has been shown to dampen acute inflammation via the glucocorticoid mechanism. Now, let's leave that and move to evidence number two. What I'm going to tell you now is a set of studies that have been done by two fantastic physiologists that challenges the view that all anti-inflammatory effects are vaguely driven. If you're surprised, let me give you the gist. Two wonderful physiologists by the name of Davide Martelli and Robin McCallan have published a series of 18 papers, the bulk of which are original research articles. Remember, I told you according to the cholinergic quote-unquote anti-inflammatory pathway, everything happens in Vegas. Las Vegas, baby. But that is the exact view that Davide Martelli and Robin McCallan challenge. The most impactful paper was them using the exact same model as what Tracy Lab and many others used who support the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway and tested it. Yes, it is a sepsis model using the lethal doses of lipopolysaccharide. While the Feinstein Institute folks used a combination of denervation, stimulation and transgenic mice to demonstrate that all effects are mediated via the vagus, Martelli and McAllen are classic physiologists. In the best way that they can, they tested the hypothesis that there could potentially be other nerves. And how do they do it? By sequentially transecting those nerves and still showing that the anti-inflammatory effect of vagus stimulation was present. In one study published in Brain, in one study published in the journal Brain Behavior and Immunology, Davide Martelli and Robin McAllen did a very cool experiment. They stimulated the cervical vagus and recorded postsynaptic potential. They were able to record postsynaptic potentials in the splanchnic nerve, pre-celiac ganglia, and in the splenic nerve, post-celiac ganglia, and none on the abdominal vagus, as proposed by Tracy. And if Kevin Tracy was exactly right, if efferent vagus was the only nerve responsible for these effects, as proposed by Kevin Tracy, the anti-inflammatory effects should be gone when the efferent vagus or the abdominal vagus was transected. Martelli and McAllen tested this hypothesis. They showed that when cervical vagus was stimulated, in the presence of LPS, they could record E-caps in the splanchnic nerve and in the splenic nerve. Then to identify the exact nature of where the signals that were identified in the sympathetic nerves, namely the splanchnic nerve, they transected the abdominal vagus. And despite the transaction of the abdominal vagus, E-caps were still intact in the splanchnic nerve and the splenic nerve. What they showed afterwards was extremely insightful. To me, it almost qualifies as an absolute slap in the face of the cholinergic anti-inflammatory reflex. They showed that mere manipulation of the nerve and the act of surgical exposure of the vagus resulted in the anti-inflammatory effect are almost on par with vagal stimulation. And when they denervated the splanchnic nerve, the anti-inflammatory effect in response to LPS challenge was gone. So through this work, they showed that it wasn't all in the vagus and sympathetic nerves are also involved in the efferent response. We'll drop a link to all the papers by Martelli and McAllen in the show notes, so if you're really interested, go ahead and read them. In a further series of papers that involve systematic physiological experiments, they showed that anti-inflammatory effect is a sum of effect across many abdominal organs and not just the spleen and the adrenals. This lines up with studies from Amsterdam Medical Center and in inflammatory bowel disease that the business end of most of these are all sympathetic and not vagally mediated. So what we are essentially saying is that vagal stimulation does work in reducing inflammation, but 
when somebody claims that the mechanism is solved and that is all residing in the vagus and it's absolutely parasympathetic, the evidence points to the contrary and shows that there are other nerves involved in the process. And those other nerves are not entirely parasympathetic, but also sympathetic. So if you're a trainee or if you're an established investigator who listens to this podcast, one of the key things that you might ask is there was a paper that was published last year from the Feinstein Institute that showed that the brainstem locus was found to be the dorsal motor vagal nuclei from which the vagus efferent fibers originate. I think that paper was published in PNAS. But the issue after reviewing that paper extensively is that there is not a single control that demonstrates the lack of expression in the adjoining nuclei of the brainstem from which sympathetic fibers originate. Nor was there any direct recording demonstrated to show that it was the dorsal motor vagal nuclei. And all the evidence from Martelli and McAllen was published before this paper was published. So why did the reviewers choose to ignore it and let Kevin Tracy get away with it? Well, you can be the judge, jury, and the executioner. So what I'm trying to say to all of you who are listening is that even when people say that we have already proven using transgenic animals, the right controls were not done. If you don't believe it, go back and check the papers. Now let's move away from the idea of the cervical vagus stimulation and the fact that the mechanism might actually not be entirely parasympathetic but could also involve sympathetic nerves. What other evidence is there to show that there are sympathetic nerves and modulation of the sympathetic nerves can actually have a beneficial impact? For that, I can quote from my own personal experience that the sympathetic nerve, like the splenic nerve, does in fact play a role in modulating inflammation. I'm a state that I have worked for the company GSK Bioelectronics and Gilvani Bioelectronics and served as the inventor for all of the foundational patents for the company. So therefore, I do have personal information. So I'm going to take you back in time to some of my personal anecdotes about the whole thing and let you decide. The year was 2013 and the bioelectronics unit was created at GlaxoSmithKline and the Nature Commentary was published in June 2013. And as I probably said in the previous episodes that I was employee number two in the unit and I had another colleague of mine who had joined at the same time. She was officially the more senior person at the time, a director by grade and I was a manager. And at this point, there was mission to do two things within the company. To test new novel autonomic nerve targets and assess its impact on disease models in animals or the biomarkers. And the second was to explore what the neural code was to enable exploration of closed loop stimulation. This was later picked up by the National Institute of Health and became the foundation for the SPARC program. More details on that if and when any of you meet me in person. Or you can ask Kip Ludwig. Soon, we came to the understanding that recording neural signals or what everyone calls as a neural code is not essentially required for autonomic nerves. It might be more suited for existing therapies. It might be more suited for existing therapies like deep brain stimulation and spinal cord stimulation where the existing neuromodulators have no clue of what they are modulating. But if one was exploring the type of nerves and many branches of the autonomic nerves, as long as we identify the exact location based on the anatomy, the hierarchy and the level of control, neural code is not essentially required. I'm willing to be challenged on this in any open forum. So if one is exploring vagus stimulation at the cervical level, you could make an argument to understand neural code because for the type of nerves that one is working on, what we had proved with evidence through multiple studies was that for the type of work that we were working on and for the type of nerves that we were working on, of which none of them were the vagus, understanding the hysteresis of stimulation and response was essential to guide therapy duration 
one does not need to have selectivity as or understanding the neural code to enable exploration of a closed loop stimulation. So for modulating nerve targets that are more distal from the brain and closer to the end organ, the trick is to understand the ideal location for where you want to place the electrode and understand risk versus benefit. And as a safety pharmacologist, as a physiologist, and also as someone who has worked in the clinic, this was quantifying the risk versus benefit was easy. So once you do this, you can gather understanding on how much or how little a particular nerve needs to be modulated so that we're not constantly hitting it with a hammer, a la deep brain stimulation or spinal cord stimulation. So back in 2013, while we went and scouted many projects afterwards, there was one project that we were given marching orders for to go and coax and try to push the investigator from Feinstein Institute, Kevin Tracy, to move towards more end organ focused stimulation. Two reasons. Setpoint had already completed its early pilot clinical trials. And two, because Galvani wanted something to hold on to. After multiple phone calls and in-person meetings between my directorial colleague and Kevin Tracy's lab, it resulted in a proposal that was still not optimal. The research unit's goal was to test if splenic stimulation resulted in anti-inflammatory effect. But when proposed, Kevin's lab was not having any of this and wanted a second project in recording vagus nerve activity in response to LPS challenge and identify the signature for TNF and IL-1 and the only way that they were going to do the splenic nerve stimulation was if the decoding the neural code in response to LPS challenge was funded. And during discussions and diligence, we pulled out that this was also a project that was funded by DARPA, but there still appeared to be a certain element of push from the Feinstein Institute to fund this on top of the DARPA money, in addition to performing the splenic nerve stimulation studies as we had asked for. A total budget of $600,000 for the two studies was drawn up. Long story short, the work did not go anywhere. And after a few months, my colleague, who at the time had no background in neuromodulation, moved on to another role. And I, as the sole remaining person in the unit, inherited the project. Due to lack of intended results, or must I say politely, a lack of intent, I decided to move and close the project. There were discussions that happened and something that I might only share with closed circles, but that is not material for this podcast. But before I gave up on the project, I asked Kevin Tracy's lab to perform one experiment that was an extension of the work of a former postdoc from Feinstein who published his first independent research paper. Louis Zeloa who had by then moved from Feinstein, published a paper that showed for the first time that he could stimulate the cut ends of the splenic nerve, where the denervation was immediately after the celiac ganglia, and stimulating that cut end reduced TNF-alpha levels in response to LPS challenged. So this was the first demonstration that one could regulate the efferent nerves that was completely disconnected from everything proximal to it and showed that the impact of splenic nerve stimulation was indeed anti-inflammatory. So my suggestion to Tracy Lab at the time was to test if intact splenic nerve stimulation could actually be tested. And at this point, for GSK Bioelectronics at the time, only a proof of concept was all that was needed. But once again, to cut straight to the chase, no progress meant that I had to stop all the work and move on to cut our losses. So, while listening to all this, you might actually be thinking, while it, is, it can be perceived as my word against somebody else's, if you are in the field, you would know that Galvani Bioelectronics is very much focused on splenic nerve stimulation. So you must be wondering, if Kevin Tracy's lab did not generate that data, who did? So, Rewinding it back to 2014. So proving that the splenic nerve stimulation works to produce an anti-inflammatory effect was through the work of an incredible scientist and a good friend, Philippe Blanco. 
and there is a remarkable story that is associated with this as well. And I shared this briefly on another podcast called Sugar Signs that discusses type 1 diabetes when a paper came out in Nature Biotechnology. So, back in 2013, Philippe, at the same time as the work was planned with Kevin Tracy's lab, proposed to work with us to explore funding for a type 1 diabetes project. And the work that I just said was published in Nature Biotechnology many years later. He was exploring the modulation of the nerve signaling to the lymph nodes around the pancreas and how it impacts antigen cross-presentation and type 1 diabetes pathogenesis. Previously, prior to Philippe talking to us, he had just published a paper that demonstrated that adrenergic agents prevented the type 1 diabetic animals from having less autoimmune processes that would ultimately lead to destruction of the pancreas. So, the idea that we came up in discussions with Philippe was to see, instead of testing molecular agents, if we could selectively and locally modulate the sympathetic neurotransmitter release to the lymph nodes where the action was taking place, according to this hypothesis, without producing a systemic effect that a neurotransmitter agent like adrenaline or any other adrenergic agent would be producing, if dosed orally or systemically. Philippe at the time did some very careful dissection and narrowed down on this nerve target in mice. Few months went by and Philippe very diligently gathered positive data to show that he could stop the activation of autoimmune processes in the lymph node of the, around the pancreas with nerve stimulation. But then the question that ate both me and Philippe at the time was that the mice are extremely tiny. So how do we demonstrate and do the right controls to show that the current doesn't spread anywhere? Remember at the time that I told you that Philippe was stimulating the nerve to the lymph nodes around the, the pancreas and this nerve was sympathetic and the fibers were actually going through the gastroduodenal nerve and this produced an anti-inflammatory effect by suppressing the autoimmune activation. So the question was, does the induced stimulation also spread to the adjoining nerves, for example, this, the nerves to the spleen. So Philippe performed an excellent negative control, which was to show that stimulation at the pancreatic nerves did not alter what the known function of the spleen would be. When this experiment was performed, where the animals were stimulated on the nerve to the lymph node of the pancreas, the mice were challenged with LPS, and it was shown stimulation of the nerve to the lymph nodes of the pancreas did not have any impact in reducing TNF-alpha. But on the flip side, the opposite experiment was also performed. Stimulating the splenic nerve was shown to not have any impact on the E-caps recorded from the pancreatic lymph nodes or antigen cross-presentation in the pancreatic lymph nodes while still having an effect in reducing TNF-alpha. Both of these results are published currently in Figure 1 of the Nature Biotech paper, where intact splenic nerve stimulation led to a reduction in TNF-alpha production, while stimulating the gastroduodenal nerve did not. And that's the story of how splenic nerve stimulation came to be, through an ingenuity of a little-known immunologist by the name of Philippe Blancou, and his resourcefulness and the care to do the right controls. So Galvani Bioelectronics at the time caught on to this finding and proceeded to develop a cuff and an IPG suited for stimulating the splenic nerve that is currently in clinical trials. So why is this area very interesting? Because at this point of time, based on our knowledge, there are five companies that are exploring neuromodulation to treat inflammatory disorders directly by modulation of nerves. First, we covered Setpoint, who are developing a unibody device to activate the cervical vagus nerve to treat rheumatoid arthritis. Second, I just told you the story of Galvani Bioelectronics, who are developing a device that goes around the splenic artery and seeks to stimulate the nerves to the spleen to do the same thing as what Setpoint does. And 
because I was a past employee of Gilvani by Electronics, I must add that Gilvani's nerve cuff is the first one that I know of that goes around the pulsating artery and seeks to stimulate the nerves. It came with developmental challenges compared to just a discrete cuff or a unibody device around the cervical vagus. I know quite a bit about the cuff design that Gilvani. Pretty sure Gilvani will also share this in due course. The third company is a company called Second Wave. This company spawned out of the lab of Hubert Lim from University of Minnesota. They partnered with Medtronic back in 2012 and 2013 and then shifted their partnership to work with GE. We covered that in the episode with Hubert Lim, Mikhail Shapiro and Chris Puglio last year. So please go back and listen to that episode. But in a gist, Second Wave is seeking to perform ultrasound neuromodulation of the spleen as a way to dampen inflammation. The fourth in the order of company formation was IOTA Biosciences and this came out of the idea of Michel Maharbis and Jose Carmena at Caltech and converted their neural dust idea into a splenic neuromodulation idea. So far, I must say that the data is largely unknown except for two abstracts at a conference or two. The big splash that IOTA Biosciences made was that they were acquired by Astellas for a 300 odd million dollars. So you can see the interest in neuromodulation for arthritis and other immune mediated inflammatory disorders. And finally comes Merck which has its own in-house team. They have taken a very different approach to set point on the cervical vagus. Rather than doing a blanket cervical vagus stimulation in a very non-specific manner as set point does, they look to apply a multi-electrode construct, preferably what it looks like at this point of time, applying graphene electrodes to activate selectively the intended fibers on the cervical vagus. You can listen to more on that in the episode where we interviewed Robert Spolgen, the head of Merck Bioelectronics. And we have a feeling that some news is impending for Merck in 2023. So stay tuned on that. But we promised one thing at the end of episode number two, which is to talk of the commercial challenges. In fact, this is the elephant in the room that most people are choosing to ignore, but we are not going to do that. You know pretty well that an implantable system or a medical device takes time for it to be uptaken into clinical practice and it is dependent on many factors. First, it depends on the medical discipline or speciality. For example, based on history, we know that cardiologists love medical devices much more than say a rheumatologist. The current state of rheumatoid arthritis treatment is a prescription painkiller and injectable antibodies or biotech agents. In some cases, joint injection of steroids as Paul Peter Tuck mentioned in the last episode. So the question is, how do you incentivize a rheumatologist who has no idea of how nerve stimulation works to adopt a new treatment, especially a neuromodulation treatment, be it implantable or a non-invasive device? And if you're listening to me talk and wondering, what do I mean by saying that physicians will have barriers? Let me tell you a bit more. I'm talking about barriers that are practical and mental. And it is no secret either. Whether you're a medical device company or you're making an iPhone, you have to think of the customers. The customers to whom these devices will be marketed to. And in the case of neuromodulation devices for rheumatoid arthritis, customers will be the rheumatologists. And the reality of the situation is that they have no current knowledge of nerve stimulation or how to perform them. And in, even in the clinical trials, they leave it to their neurosurgeon colleagues in the case of cervical vagus implants or in the case of Galvani, a gastrointestinal surgeon who performs laparoscopy will have to implant the device. So in reality, a rheumatologist needs to assess the patient, refer them to an implantation center, 
And for this to happen, they need to get along with the neurosurgeon or a GI surgeon. And then the implanting surgeon is going to implant the patient, but they are never going to see the patient beyond the operative and the post-operative period. So if this was the case, if this was a complicated referral pathway and implantation pathway, it is going to be extremely difficult. But if you're in the area, you might argue with me that this probably happened in sleep apnea as well. When hypoglossal nerve stimulation was developed by Inspire Medical, it took a long time for physicians to adopt the therapy. In fact, I remember conversations that I've had with companies like ResMed and Philips, where the chief medical officers of ResMed and Philips did not see hypoglossal nerve stimulation as a threat because the sleep physicians were not trained to do so. But over the last eight years, things have slowly picked up. There are more ENT surgeons who are also double board certified as both ENT surgeons and sleep physicians. So the ENT surgeons were quoted by Inspire Medical and those double certified ENT surgeons and sleep physicians serve as the champion for the centers of excellence. So over time, Inspire Medical has been on an upward trajectory to adoption. But still, compared to the incidence of sleep apnea, the number of implants that actually happens on a monthly basis is relatively less. So in conclusion, the more complicated the referral pathway and the implantation pathway, the more difficult the adoption process is going to be. One may not like it, but healthcare is a business. The people involved, the system involved, and everybody involved tries to make money to sustain. So the question is, if a patient is not going to come back to a particular physician, what is the incentive for a neurosurgeon or a GI surgeon to implant these devices? Secondly, if you're a rheumatologist, a rheumatologist needs to understand a whole new area of nerve stimulation and seek to modulate the parameters, something that they are not innately trained to do. So the adoption of neuromodulation for immune-mediated inflammatory disease requires both a steep learning curve on the side of rheumatologist and good people's management and incentivization for the implanters like the neurosurgeon or the GI surgeon. People will always say that you can overcome these challenges by setting up centers of excellence where people work together. But by setting up a center of excellence, the uptake by definition is going to be slow. This is the elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about. To be frank, at Galvani, it was a very dismissive view where many times... I've had to bang my head constantly against the wall. There have been instances when me or another colleague brought it up. Two answers were given, depending on the situation. First was, build it and they will come. Or, the second answer was, we will figure it out. Or we will partner with someone who will commercialize. These answers were a constant source of anguish for me. And I've not seen anyone ask these questions out of set point to this date either. For everybody else, including the non-invasive devices, one needs to be asking the exact same questions out of them to understand their revenue and commercialization model. So, we leave you with questions, questions and questions. Our aim was not to give you all the answers but only to raise the questions so you can think about these when you are approaching a problem or even listen to topics like these at conferences. So there you have it, folks. That's the end of our mini-series, The Inflammatory Wanderer. Hope you enjoyed it. For us to keep bringing these episodes to you, it has been a lot of work, a lot of late evenings and an extremely high amount of production. We need more financial help. So if you know of anyone or if you want to sponsor, a small grant goes a long way. To be honest, if you're in an industry 
it will be a fraction of what you pay for a booth or a stall at conferences. And your name stays with the podcast forever. Not a bad deal at all. Until next time, this is Arun Shridhar signing off. It's been a pleasure to be in your ears. Thank you.